Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's ODI Friday Got Time Lecture. Uh, I'm Hannah Folds, the Head of Marketing and Membership here at the ODI. Um, it's a real pleasure today to invite my colleagues, Laura and Amelia, uh, in for a lunchtime lecture. They're studying, the re their PhD researchers, based at the ODI, studying uh, data search with us. Um, and they're being supervised by Jenny Tennyson from the ODI and Eleanor Simpel from the University of Southampton. So over to you. Oh, just uh, a few housekeeping things. First thing is, um, if you're watching from the live stream, um, uh, please use hashtag ODI Fridays to ask any questions or to talk about the event or if you're in the room. And also, um, uh, if you're wanting to ask a question, please wait until the very end and we can pass you the mic. Um, and then people at home or at work who are watching will be able to hear you. Thanks. Over to you. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone, and thanks for taking the time. My name is Laura Kirsten. This is Emilia Katzbrek. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the research that we've been doing here at the ODI over the past two years, where we looked at data search and data discovery. Um, we are both in the third years of our PhDs, um, and we're part of an EU Horizon 2020 program that's called WD Aqua, in which we work on a question answering system that uses web data to answer questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, we're going to tell you a bit about the background of our work, um, what we mean by data, what we mean by search. Um, and we'll outline why data search is complex, both from a technical but also from a user or interaction perspective. Um, and we'll describe how we imagine the future of data search and discuss, discuss some of the research that we've been doing in this area. But first of all, to make sure that we all talk about the same thing, um, there are many different definitions of data, but what we mean by data here is information that's organized um, explicitly, so that's structured in some way. So imagine spreadsheets, uh, web tables, maps, things like that. And the question that we've been wondering about is, why is data still so hard to find? Who's ever struggled to find data here? <laughs> we definitely have as well. And um, we've, we've been asking, we've been interviewing data professionals, so people who work with data in their day jobs and how they feel about searching and finding data on the web. This is what common answers looked like. To situate this a bit, broadly speaking, when we search for data, we try to, f to answer a question with data or we try to find a data set uh, to work with. Um, so one, this is an example of a very high level question. Can we find links between Trump's political decisions and his personal business interests? Um, so the problem with such a question is that it would need to be broken down into several sub questions. Um, and these would be the types of searches that people do to answer such a question. One of the problem is, problems with data search is that, we, that it's often exploratory. So we don't really know what data we can expect to find. So we don't really know how to ask for it and how to search for it. And in the case of our question, we'd probably find, um, try to find a data set that ha has all the corp um, that lists the company, companies owned by the Trump family and also a list of all the executive orders done during the Trump administration and relate them to each other. In reality, we'd probably also try to find different other data sets and add them to it, um, in, depending on the actual detail that we'd want to find out. In addition to talking to data professionals, we've also um, done a search log analysis. We looked at the logs of four national open data portals, including the Office of National Statistics and Data.gov UK. And we looked at the queries. The queries are the keywords that you type in into search engines in order to find what you're looking for. And we found that people search for data differently than they search for, for traditional websites. So we found the queries are shorter, people ask less direct questions, and they also um, put more temporal information in the queries. So that means they specify a year or a time period that the data talks about. Um, just to understand why it's so hard to find data, we are going to walk you through a number of challenges uh, that people need to, need to go against. Some of them are new purely connected with the technology that is used to build data search functionalities, 
those could be summed up in three points. Uh, data is often hidden in files that are not visible for search engine. That means search engines cannot see the content of the file and the only thing they can rely on when searching for, for such a content is the metadata that is provided. This results in vast majority of data not being indexed by search engines and it doesn't really matter what kind of query you put, they would be just not found. Uh, Google and obviously other web search engines are not directly indexing um, the, the content that is structured data. They, 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 they are built to structure to index web pages and these web pages containing only mostly text. And this was the, this was the prim primary idea for the functionality. So when we think about structured data, we cannot index it straightforward in exactly the same way. Um, and the last one, the data search is conceptually different. Search functionalities um, need to mirror the fact that we think and use data differently than other sources of information. For example, when we need uh, to answer a question or a task that we have with data, we often need more than one data set as we showed earlier in the example. Uh, this indicates that we need to rethink how search should um, on so how search for data should work uh, in terms of indexing, ranking, and presenting the results to the user. But also, if we look at data search from a user perspective, um, things don't quite work the same way. So it's currently not as easy to find data sets as it is to find websites. Um, there are more steps required to, to, first of all, get to the data, but then also to get to an answer that might be within the data. It's, sort of, it's also harder to keep track of where things are. You often need to click through a couple of pages to get to a download link, um, or you need to go to dedicated data portals and sort of remember where a data set was sitting when you try to find it again. Um, and as Emilia already said, we often need to combine different data sets uh, in order to answer a question. We also know that in comparison to reading, there are a number of different or additional skills required to find and understand data. So in order to access and find data, we need to be able to deal with, um, with different formats. We need to understand connected licenses. We might want to combine data sets from different domains that come packaged up differently, that have different naming conventions or schematas, and we sort of need to find a way to put them together. Um, but also we need to be able to interpret and understand data in its context. Because if we look at something like this, we don't immediately understand what this means, or I don't. Um, and as much as this might be true for some text that's online as well, we think, we think about data differently, and it is not the same as reading. Um, because one of the characteristics of data is that it is not in the same way self-descriptive as text is. And so we need tools that help us to be able to understand it in its context and that provide some information about the data that comes together with it. So what about the future? Um, <coughs> we imagine search for data to be equally easy as searching for websites, but also for images, for maps, for flights, um, for flight on the web. Um, we think that data as, a, data as a source of information is so unique that we can't just use the same approaches that have been used for other domains. Um, because, so we think about tools that help people make sense of data. For instance, tools that recommend data sets based on one that you already have that are similar to it or based, that you've just, based on one that you've just found. Or tools that would summarize data based on the type of query or question you put in a search um, engine. Um, but also tools that allow zooming in and out of data collections that you find in search results easily so that you would get to an, an easy overview of a data collection but also be able to explore it in more detail to actually understand what it is that you're presented with. Um, 
We believe that we need tools that provide context to data, um, that let you understand where a data set comes from and how and why it's been created. Because one of the things that we realized when, when talking to data professionals and in the course of our research was that so much of understanding data comes actually from understanding how it's been put together and for what purpose. Some of you might ask the question of why this is so relevant or why an organization as the ODI invests in such research. Um, I think the answer is quite simple. If we make data easier to use um, and data search better, data can not only be used by, by a small number of data professionals or fairly technical people, but by many more. Um, and so we would, yeah. Uh, so we think, we think if, the, if access to data is easier and if, remove, if we remove the barriers that we currently have between people and data, then we make data truly open. So we think yeah, if data cannot, if no one can find and understand data, it is not open. And with the growing amount of data that's been put online, data search is becoming more important and it's sort of becoming an essential part of a general data infrastructure. So going back to reality for a while, <laughs> Uh, we will discuss some of our work that um, we've been doing in this direction. <coughs> After identifying that existing descriptions of data that are provided uh, on, for example, open data platforms, that here we have example of a description for one of the data sets on DataGov UK, uh, we realized that they are not providing themselves, themselves often not providing themselves useful. Um, we want to know, we, we decided that we would like to know what the features of summary that would actually be useful for a user, uh, what such features should be, what's, what kind of uh, things such a summary should contain. So we have asked 80 people in a writing task to summarize a data set for us. Uh, this gave us 400 summaries, which we then asked people again to rank according to the quality. And this experiment allowed us to determine the key attributes of, um, of, of a summary that are necessary to, to give a context to the user of the data in the future. Uh, we formalized this as a template that could be provided to, a pub for example, publisher of the data. Uh, and the template consists of questions. Here we just see a few of the questions just to give an overview. Uh, some of them could be generated automatically. Some of them needs to be provided by a human, by a publisher. Uh, such a summary, we believe that such a summary would provide itself useful not only to the user of the data, but also could be helpful for search uh, and indexing functionalities that, as we said earlier, are working well, well with the text. One of the other things we looked at was um, how to provide context to numbers in data sets. So numbers are f f were on the one hand the most popular data type, especially in data sets on open data portals, but they're also the ones that require the most context for us to understand what they mean. Um, so looking at numbers in data sets, we were working on an approach that analyzes the rows and the columns in a data set and tries to automatically work out what these numbers might mean. Um, so we try to assign semantic meaning to such numbers. And for example, if you have a column in a spreadsheet that lists the populations of all countries, we would take the, all the numbers in that column, look at their distribution, and then match this distribution to existing knowledge bases on the web, such as Wikidata, DBpedia. And if we find a distribution that's the same, or let's say fairly similar, we can sort of infer that this column actually talks about the numbers of populations in countries. Um, approach is a bit more complex than that, but that sort of describes the idea. And so the, idea, um, the aim is to automatically understand what numbers in data sets are talking about. Because if we can do that, then we can store this information together with the data in, in the metadata, and it's easier to find. Um, 
So yes, both the, both the summaries that Emilia talked about and these semantic labels to numbers in data sets, they both, both of these information could be added to existing metadata. And we see metadata as the point of interaction between a user and the data set, but at the same time, the point of interaction between a search engine and a data set. So it is in both cases really important for data search. And the, the general aim of our work was to understand, or is <laughs> to understand what is the right amount and what is the right content of information that should be stored together with the data set in order for it to be searchable. And with this, we hope to build on and extend existing metadata standards. Uh, so in summary, data search is complex, both in terms of technical approaches and from interaction point of view. We hope it will mature as a research area, hopefully soon. <laughs> in our work, we try to look at some of the aspects that could improve data search by analyzing how people uh, look for data, how people search for data, uh, what summaries of data should look like, uh, how to understand the context of numbers in data sets and resulting from all above uh, ideas for data uh, metadata guidance guidelines Sorry. Um, that's all from us today thank you for coming and thank you for listening okay it's time for questions um, Again, can you use IDI Friday's hashtag if you're um, using the live stream? And uh, can you talk into the microphone to ask a question? That would be great. Otherwise, people watching on the live stream won't be able to hear you. Um, I've got a question to kick off with. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, what can large data portals do to um, improve how people s use them to search? I think the main thing they could do is to, like, to work together um, with researchers or with organizations li like the ODI and sort of work on removing the barriers that are between people want, this is very much a new, a new area where we can still try many things out and it's not set how, we don't really know how data sets should be resulted in such, res uh, in such results, for example. Um, yeah, and sort of removing these barriers and making s such collaborations easier would be one thing. Thanks. Question here. Could you give us some idea what it, uh, s about semantic labels for numbers? I mean, is it more than big, small, or medium? A semantic label. So, semantic label in our in our context is when you look at the at the data set, you have number of columns, and uh, each column can be described by a concept that is well known in semantic web. So for example, we know that this population in a specific column is exactly the same population that is in different data sets, and also that is in, for example, Wikipedia, which is described in DBpedia or Wikidata uh, database or knowledge base. So we would like to, um, or like the, the in ideal, ideal wor world, we would see everything connected to the same concepts that, are, that everybody understands and that can search for. So, so for example, we have column population or for a column with countries of European <laughs> Union, for example, or, or <laughs> yeah, so we, for example, know that these are exactly the same populations. Maybe the numbers are different, right? Because information can differ between sources, but we know that this is what we mean by this specific number in opposition, in opposition to just having a number. So actually misunderstood. So you are the, the semantic element refers to the labeling of the set rather than uh, some kind of indication of the actual values of the number. Because obviously it's very difficult <coughs> to get numbers to be the same. They'll always be different. Yes, but we can know what the concepts, what, what, what is the concept of this number. So we, we know that these numbers mean population, for example, of cities in this specific data set. Is there any way you could assign uh, some sort of figure of merit? If, if you have a population list, for example, mm -hmm. it, could you assign uh, some sort of word which says how similar these lists are or how different these lists are? Which one might you not trust or something like that? 
So I think it's very much dependent if you trust the source, right? So if you, if, if you trust the publisher of the data, for example, in terms of open data portal, if you trust Wikipedia as a source, some people will might, say, might say, oh, I don't trust Google Maps because Google or something, some, something similar. But I guess nowadays we all need to validate the data that we look at. So so you just need you you just need to make the educated guess if the data is trustworthy. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned these summaries you were collecting from people, and and I was wondering how these summaries are going to be used well, for the data sets you're describing. How could they um, help? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the summaries. So from a research perspective, we just want we wanted to find out how do people describe data sets. If they have no idea, if like if you see a spreadsheet and you have no idea what this is about, how would you describe it to another person who can't um, who can't see it at the moment? Um, but they would be used um, first of all. They're meant they're meant for data publishers in order to put context or um, to put a to context to the data set and has been proven in, in web search we use snippets of text so in search results you get these little elements of text um, that help you understand what the page is talking about before you have to click on it and so they would we would like these summaries to act as guidance for for data publishers on how such a summary should be written what should it contain what are the different elements that should be there so people can understand what the data set is about without downloading it. But um, what we would like to do is to create a tool that takes the elements of these summaries that could be created or extracted automatically from the data and provi provides them automatically and then only input um, the elements that are not as easy to automatically extract and sort of help people. If something like that would work, um, then it would be much easier to create good quality summaries for a larger scale of data sets. Um, yeah, and so the, the idea behind it was is that we we know or research has shown that we actually find it quite hard to create free text without any sort of narrative structure or any guideline. Um, and so starting with such a guideline was what we were trying to do here. Yeah. Is there a blurred line between um, searching for structured data and searching for information. So when I think about when I search for flights using Google, I don't necessarily search for a data set that contains um, data about when flights are happening and when they're not, but rather uh, Google serves me up increasingly sort of structured um, data about that. Um, yeah, is, is there a bit of a blurred line between structured data and information and searching for both? Um, yes, so that, I mean, if you talk about flights, I uh, give that example. We it is structured data, but the, the difference to the scenario that we are talking about is that with flights, you know, ex we know exactly where that data is. And we also know exactly what, what people want to know about it. So it's much easier to build applications that work for a set scenario where we know what the data is, we know what people search for, and we can sort of create um, functionalities around that. Whereas in, it's a bit more like searching within the spreadsheet even, or, or within the database. Um, whereas in the scenario, of the like of the open web is we don't know where the data sits. It comes in different formats, and it's there's no schema behind that. So it's much much harder to actually get to the data. That answers your question. So, so you're talking about this semantic part and the labeling part, but a lot of the slides you, uh, they um, they had things like, you know, Trump companies data set which is obviously like a fairly um, ethereal, <laughs> ethereal uh, search from, from the work, you know, if you're sitting where the data set is. Um, have you thought at all about how, how things would work when you start graphing them? So, so when you have like Trump and data set and companies, then you know, what, what is a Trump company? Because there are companies that Trump's heavily involved in, Trump and it, companies that Trump might own, companies that Trump's family might own, and they're only really like a click or a link apart. And I'm sure a search engine could understand that difference, but it's, it's a question of knowing that there is that, that link to follow and then, and then following it without making the 
the person going through it? Is that something that you figure fits into the big picture? <laughs> So we've, we've been focusing on how to search for, I don't know if I understood correctly, I'm sorry, um, how to search for what kind of metadata could help users to, un to, to, to input such a, such, a, such a query as, for example, Trump companies, but then depending on the task, you would you would want to assess which, which companies you actually want to take into account, right? I, I don't... Um, thank you. Uh, kind of, yeah, but with, um, with, with the textual web, you do a Google search and then you might follow a, a couple of clicks through. Mm -hmm. um, so something like related data sets, this is what you mean? Yeah, r related, but not necessarily Related, but in a, in a very specific, predictable mm -hmm. way that a computer would actually be able to realise, like, oh, and this company is owned by this company, which is owned by this company, and they have directors. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasoning to do in, in such a case. I know that the research is looking also how to, how to do such a reasoning uh, over semantic web, but I think with data that is not in the semantic web, that it's very much, we don't really know what is inside data sets yet, so, so clearly, I think we are not that far yet with, with for example, open data or, or, or not always. Maybe some of them would, would work, but um, I don't think we are there yet. Okay, long way off, cool. <laughs> and I guess one of the reasons we haven't, been we, so we haven't been looking in that direction, and I think one of the reasons was that in when we started, we looked at what are actually the most pop popular data types, and it, we found that on open data portals, it's like roughly 2% of RDF data sets. So we tried not to focus our our research um, in the too much in the semantic web area. Too. Um, um, going back to the semantic labels, um, two things. One is y are you um, expecting hopefully that they could be automatically generated by an algorithm? And, and second, do you see them the semantic label, do you see them structured in a, in a sort of D-way classification sort of thing? Or, or, or otherwise, what sort of structure would the semantic label have to maintain consistency, be useful throughout a large number of data sets? So in the ideal world, it would be automatic. Probably it's the, the um, how in the real world would work it would work now, it would be semi-automatic that we suggest a list of the most probable labels for a given concept. Obviously something like city and, and its population would be much easier to disambiguate to some specific semantic label in opposition to some concepts that are just simply are not there yet in semantic web, for example, in DBpedia or Wikidata. And in terms of what, how such a semantic label would, would look like, it's um, so in our work, we looked how to how to disambiguate specific columns. So every column would be uh, disambiguated to a property or a class. So for example, it would be one unique identifier from, for example, DBpedia describing for population. So we don't know that there is this group of populations. And then by the class assigned to different column in the data set, which is, for example, city, we would know that this 20 data sets in a set talk about cities and populations. So maybe for a query city population or like London population, if we know that London is a city, then we can point to those 20 data sets, for example. Hi, um, I missed the first part of your presentation, so I'm not sure if this question is really relevant, but anyway. Um, I get the impression that you are trying to push for a standard for metadata. Um, I was just wondering if uh, if you could uh, give us a an example of an organ maybe an organization or maybe uh, a, a local government or national government which you think is a you know the gold standard or um, one of the best standards for all of this. Like, uh, as you sh you're saying that semantic and metadata. The reason I ask is that. I think um, 
your research has the assumption of you know really good struct of really good structured data, but the reality is also that's the ideal world. But the reality is that a vast majority of 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 uh, data is very much either unstructured or uncollected. Um, I'm just um, you know coming from my from my perspective. I come from from the Philippines, a developing country. Um, date collecting data is still not. Uh, part of the priority or even in the mindset of our local officials and it would be great to see like okay if we if uh you know uh, as we shift into to collecting more data it'd be great if we try to as much as possible like at the early stages even you know structure it at, at this kind of, of 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 level so that's just my my question like essentially if you've got like a you know a gold a gold standard a good standard for 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 uh, starting organizations so they can look into it. If, if you, for example, think of a summary, I don't think data needs to be very, very clean. If in, ca in this case, if it's maybe the automatic generation bit wouldn't work as, 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 as well as on a very nicely structured data, but still user, user summary for a user could, could be done for every data set and it would already improve the user experience <coughs> when searching. And maybe to add to that, so the, if the data sets we've used for this summarization experiment, they were not necessarily clean. They had missing values as well. They had the formats of dates were, mi were mixed up. And that was intentionally because what we wanted to have is realistic summaries of, of the actual data that is there, that, that they didn't assume um, clean or extremely structured data. But I think in terms of standards, I mean, there are metadata standards. And I don't know, for example, data of your case using something based on DCAT. Um, but I think, schema uh, or, or schema, yeah, schema the dog. But um, the things that we looked at was if we try to think about what makes these, standard, these existing fields in metadata standards, what, how can they be really used for search and what could we add for things to be more understandable from a user or from an interaction perspective? How can we take a step like further and think of what is missing there? What could be added to that? We're not claiming to, we're not creating a, a standard per se, but just looking at standards and saying, what could we add that would be more useful or improve um, discoverability of the, of the resources? For example, all of those standards do have a description field. So there is the description in those metadata standards. Just when we look, nobody really is requiring to put any specific kind of information into description. So it's everybody's writing whatever they think it's, it's important. Yeah, so the most common description of a description field in metadata standards is textual description. And it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't actually tell, tell us a lot of what, what would people want to see there or what, even if we put in the things that people would want to see there, what if this would actually help search to, to find the data? Um, so I thought the template you came up with was really interesting. In particular, the first question, which I think you said that you got people to say which, which variables they thought were the most but the most valuable or interesting. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to summarize, uh, like if you're going to su like look at getting some sort of summaries, would you, would you sort of, um, would you determine which ones were the most important programmatically? Would you just sort of say, see like what these people have said and say, oh, in general, people find this type of information uh, interesting. So that will be the sort of thing that we prioritize in the, in the summary. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah that, that's a really interesting question. This is something we've been wondering about as well, because this was well, like the first of a, of a step of sort of experience that we would like to do. But what we found is that for all of the data sets, that, for all of the summaries that we had, almost everybody had a like one sentence, high level, like subtitle or description of what this data set actually talks about. And these were, would be f what we would for now define as the key columns or as the, the subject columns. There are also some ways of automatically determining the subject column of this is the main topic of a data set. Um, or it could be determined by the publisher or by the person who created the data. But yeah, that's a question we, we've been wondering about as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
any more questions before we finish up? No. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. We've got a three-week break for Easter, so we're back on the 24th of April. Um, can we just give Laura and Amelia one last round of applause? <laughs> <laughs>